I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Anna Machin, who's here to talk about a range of aspects of sexual offending and also to cover some property offences, but not shoplifting, which is being covered on the day itself. Dr. Machin is one of the higher trainees in forensic psychiatry in the East Midlands, and at the time of filming this, has relatively recently passed the exam, so knows exactly what's relevant and what needs covering. I'll hand over now to Dr Machin. So I was planning on, on talking for a while about sexual offences as well as property offences. Um, I was going to talk a bit about the offences themselves and also about the sort of psychiatry and uh, mental health problems that can be associated with such offending. Um, I was going to start with a few questions and I think it would be good if you could have a go at them and then the answers will appear later on towards the end of the presentation. Um, so first of all, um, which one of the following mental disorders has been shown to be significantly associated with burglary? So if you just have a go, like I say, the answers will come later on. So the next one, which one of the following is not a disorder of sexual preference listed in the ICD-10? Again, which one of the following statements is false? Which of the following is the most significant risk factor in those committing the offence of criminal damage? Which one of the following is not a treatment used to reduce sexual offending? And finally, which of the following statements about exhibitionism is false? So like I say, the answers will appear later on. So I'm going to talk a little now about sexual offending. Um, so sexual offending is covered by the Sexual Offences Act 2003 and this sort of abolished a lot of the other earlier offences and there were some significant changes in rewording, particularly around the issue of consent. Um, I have included some further readings of attached, um, which you'll be able to find on the website um, and if you want a bit more information about the changes then I'd suggest you look there. I've, not, I've, I've just kept, tried to keep the content of the talk today quite focused to the exam. Um, so, the Sexual Offences Act 2003 covers offences such as rape and assault by pe penetration, sexual assault, and it also has particular chapters for when the victim's age is less than 16 or less than 13. Um, and as I said, consent is a, a really key, important issue um, in these offences. Sex offending against children will be covered on the MRC Psych Forensic Teaching Day, so I'm not going to talk too much about that now. Um, as I said, the thing that I'd like to add here is that, just to put the sexual offending into context, that it probably accounts for about 1% of all offending. Other offences that are covered in the Sexual Offences Act 2003, um, which I think are relevant to us, are offences against a person with a mental disorder, which means that their choice is impeded, and also exposure, you probably know it as indecent exposure, as well as voyeurism. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about rape to start with. Um, as I've said before, there's more information on the, on the further reading. So, rape can be described as a sexual expression of violence and the maximum punishment is life imprisonment. Whereas the maximum punishment for sexual assault is 10 years imprisonment. Moving on to indecent exposure, I'd, I'd like to talk a for a little bit longer about this. The maximum punishment here would be two years in prison, um, and those who commit the offence of indecent exposure tend to go on to offend again, um, usually until they're convicted and then um, offending would reduce significantly. They don't tend to carry it on after they've been convicted. Um, usually there'd be no desire for contact with the victim. Um, and sexual offending doesn't, doesn't usually escalate to more serious offending. Um, but it is usual that um, this sort of offending is associated with sexual excitement. Moving on to voyeurism, or what people might call being a peeping tom, and again, the maximum punishment here would be two years in prison. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what ICD-10 has to say about um, sort of sexual offending. So 
if offending behaviour is driven by sexual or deviant fantasies, a clinical, a clinical diagnosis can be made using the ICD-10 classification system and disorders of sexual preference would fall under the coding of F65. In the DSM-4, paraphilias would be coded under 302. So ICD-10 says that for something to be a disorder of sexual preference, um, it ha there has to be a recurrent intense sexual urge and fantasy involving an unusual object or activity and people will then act on the urges or be markedly distressed by them and these recurrent intense sexual urges must be present for at least six months. So the types of disorders li listed under F65 of the ICD-10 would include fetishism, fetishistic transvestitism, exhibitionism, voyeurism, paedophilia and sadomasochism. So moving on to talk a little bit more about exhibitionism. So this is when somebody has a recurrent or persistent tendency to expose the genitalia to strangers and it, like I've already said it's usually associated with sexual arousal and masturbation. There's no intention or invitation for any contact with the, with the witnesses. Moving on to voyeurism. It's described by the ICD-10 as a recurrent or persistent tendency to watch people engaging in sexual or intimate behaviour and it's associated with sexual excitement and masturbation. Again, there's no intention to reveal the presence and they've got no intention to have any sexual involvement with those observed. It's just about watching. Moving on to paedophilia. So this is described by the ICD-10 as a persistent or a predominant preference for sexual activity with a prepubescent child or children. The perpetrator should be at least 16 years old and at least five years older than the, than the child or children. So the likelihood of more than one abnormal sexual preference occurring in an individual is greater than will be expected by chance. The most common combination would be fetishism, transvestitism and sadomasochism. There's a few other um, uncommon patterns of sexual preference that are listed in the ICD-10 and this would, include make, this would include making obscene telephone calls, frotterism, zoophilia, necrophilia, the use of strangulation or anoxia for intensifying sexual excitement and a preference for partners with some particular anatomical abnormality. So moving on now to talk about the links between mental disorders and sexual offending. The most important thing to remember here would be that most sex offenders do not have a major mental illness. Um, also, sexually, devi sexually deviant fantasies and related deviant behaviour are common in the non-offending population. And disorders of, sexual pref disorders of sexual preference are found in only a proportion of sex offenders. So I wanted now to look at the sort of different types of mental illness and the links with sex offending. I'll start with psychotic disorders. So the first thing is, as I've already said, psychotic disorders aren't usually associated with serious sexual offending, but people with psychotic illnesses may commit sexual offences. And this could be related to the psychosis, so directly, as in related to positive symptoms, or indirectly, through disinhibition. The, the other, um, another example of where people with psychosis may go on to offend sexually um, could be if there's frustration related to sexual side effects of antipsychotic medications. People with psychotic illness may also go on to sex offend and this could be completely unrelated to the psychosis, so it could just be related to the presence of deviant sexual fantasies as in the rest of the population. Moving on to talk now about mood disorders. So again, affective disorders aren't usually associated with serious sexual offending. Um, People with mania can go on to offend sexually because of symptoms such as sexual disinhibition, increased libido, and people may also have enhanced confidence or an enhanced sense of entitlement or an inflated belief in their personal attractiveness, all, all symptoms of mania. On the other hand, depression could be associated with sexual offending and this could be because internal controls are, are weakened and established psychological defences are, are broken down. So typically in an MCQ or in the cast, the example that might be given may be a middle-aged man with an unblinkered forensic history who, who has suffered with an episode of depression and goes on to commit a sexual offence. So moving on to talk about personality disorders. 
So there's higher rates of personality disorder in sex offenders, particularly in rapists, than in other offenders. And in those sex offenders with personality disorders, the, the personality disorders that people would normally have would be cluster B personality disorders, and especially dissocial personality disorder. So, talking about learning disability, um, there's evidence that males who commit sexual offences have a lower IQ than those who commit non-sexual offences, and this is especially true for paedophilia. Um, rates of sexual offending may be higher in those with learning disability because the behaviour may be appropriate to their developmental age but not their chronolo chronological age. They may have a reduced capacity to delay gratification or resist temptation. They may have a reduced capacity to modify behaviour according to experience. There may be social naivety. There may just be difficulty coping with life stressors leading to frustration. Some books will split some books will split learning disabled sexual offenders into the following categories. So first of all, developmental offenders, so people who are shy and immature. The next category would be the next category would be those people with learning disability but also with a comorbid personality disorder and these tend to be the more serious offenders um, and it can be a more persistent problem for these people. The next category would be people with learning disability who, who have sexually deviant fantasies. In this situation it's unrelated to the learning disability. Hawke found that the rate of sex offence charges were twice as high among defendants with learning disability than in those without. So sexual offending can also be associated with organic brain disease such as dementia or head injury. If you think about the symptoms that people can get in organic brain disease such as personality change, disinhibition, memory impairment, you can start to understand how that can lead to people committing sexual offences. So substance misuse can be related to sexual offending. And I, I said that in my mind I'm thinking it's, it's similar to people presenting with mania so they, they might have sexual disinhibition, increased libido, enhanced confidence and, and inflated um, belief of their personal attractiveness and again they can go on to offend sexually. Moving on to talk about treatments that are available for people who commit sex offences. So they can be bro broken down into two main categories of, of psychological treatments and biological treatments. So the, the main psychological treatment would be the Sex Offender Treatment Programme or the SATP and I'll talk more about that in a moment. So in terms of biological treatments, the main agents used are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, antiandrogens and luteinizing hormone releasing hormone. So just to give you a bit of background about the Sex Offender Treatment Programme. So the basis of it was developed by Fingal Hoare in 1986 and he suggested a four-stage model of sexual offending. The SOTP was then introduced to the prison service in 1991 and it was first used in community populations by probation in 1997. More recently the ISOTP has been introduced by Middleton and Quayle in 2007 and this focuses more on sex offending associated with the internet. So the SOTP offers a standardised treatment programme and its roots are in CBT. It's usually delivered in groups but it can also be delivered in a, on an individual basis and it can be adapted for learning disabled populations. So the SOTP splits risk factors into four domains listed here. The aims of the SOTP are to develop self-management skills, encourage collaborative effort with cognitive restructuring, modelling and positive reinforcement, allow people to gain insight and develop victim empathy, prevent relapse and build self-esteem and confront distorted attitudes towards children. So the SOTP has four stages. The first stage is assessment and that uses semi-structured interviews, PCLR, psychometric testing and sometimes a PPG. So the PPG is sometimes used because sex offenders often show a high level of denial. This technique provides a means of determining sexual arousal without having to rely on self-report. 
techniques used in the SOTP include group interaction and confrontation, role plays aiming to develop victim empathy, confrontational techniques to break down denial and victim blaming, and also looking at the cycle of abuse to identify offending triggers. So the next stage of treatment would be the core programme. This is where most of the work is done. According to Beach and Mann, the average duration of the core programme is about 80 hours and it's usually delivered in blocks of two hours, two, up two to five times per week. The next stage would be the extended programme and this looks at anger and stress management, relationship skills, as well as behavioural therapy to address fantasies. The final stage would be the booster programme and this is usually delivered about a year before somebody's released from prison. And this looks at revision of the core programme and relapse prevention. There's been quite a bit of work done looking at um, outcomes for people who've completed the sex offender treatment programme and really the evidence is quite mixed to the, about the degree to which it, it, it helps reduce reoffending. The Sex Offender Treatment Programme Evaluation Project found that reconviction rates were reduced for people who complete the SOTP, but not significantly. This project found that the SOTP is more effective for offenders classified as medium risk than for those classified as high risk. And it also concludes that interventions need to be intensive and long term when they're delivered in prisons, but also when they're delivered in the community. So I'm going to leave sex offending there and I'm going to move on to talk about property offending now. There's less to, there's less to, there's less to say here and I would say really for the exams you are, likely to, you are more likely to be asked about sexual offending than property offending but we are talking about it here because it is, it is talked about in the syllabus and I think it's important that you know a little bit about it. Um, so property offending can really be split into, into two main group. So the first would be dishonesty offences and they're covered by the Theft Act 1968 and then also offences involving criminal damage and they're covered by the Criminal Damage Act 1971. I'm not going to talk at all about shoplifting or arson and they'll be covered on the MRC Psych Forensic Training Day so it's intentional that I've left them out of this talk. As I said before if you would like to find out more about the legal aspects of property offending I suggest that you refer to the, the further reading which you'll be able to find on the website I'm going to talk for a while now about different mental disorders and their relationship with property offending. So looking first at the group of offences under the dishonesty heading, so this is sort of theft and burglary. There's no evidence to suggest a link between these sorts of offences and serious mental illness. There's some evidence to suggest a link with mental disorders such as substance misuse and personality disorder but behaviour will usually be egosyntonic and for the purpose of gain. So thinking about damage offences such as criminal damage, the main thing here is that these sorts of offences are common and so the risk factors for offending in general are very likely to be found in populations who commit the offence of criminal damage. So damage offences are particularly common in those with conduct disorder and personality disorder and they can also occur in psychotic illnesses, secondary to positive symptoms. So moving on now to the post-module question. So if we're going to go through the same questions that we did at the start um, but the answers will be here as well.
And finally, here's a list of suggested further reading. In my opinion, the most useful thing on that list is the, the link to free access to the ICD-10. Thank you.